Welcome to the PI World Thursday webinar on the 21st of May 2020 and I'm your host Tamsin Freeman. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Reg Hall who's going to enlighten us about investment trusts and investing panacea for pandemics. Reg, many thanks for joining us. Pleasure Tamsin and great to be here with everybody today. Oh. Um, for those lis listeners who don't know you, give us a short overview of your background. So, um, I have spent a very long time uh, in the city, over 35 years, started my career in stockbroking and um, uh, moved into financial PR uh, about 25 years ago. Uh, I've worked through all the sort of major crises of the last 30 something years, including the crash of 87, Big Bang, uh, the, the dot-com sell-off, the financial crisis, you name it, uh, I've seen them all. Uh, and I've had uh, a great pleasure in the last 25 years advising lots of different companies uh, in different sectors with different issues uh, and different uh, uh, things going on in their businesses, uh, good and bad. Um, and uh, in terms of my own sort of finances, I uh, run my own SIP and my own ISA. Uh, I use Interactive Investor. Uh, and around 60% of my SIP by value is in investment trusts. So why are you so keen on investment trusts? In short, I think they're a kind of superior investment vehicle uh, where the investment is effectively an aggregated fund. Uh, where the manager is investing in, in a broad range of different companies. Um, and why are they superior? So first of all, I think the PLC structure that they exist in, I think that's a really significant factor. Uh, it ensures the strong governance. It ensures you've got an independent board. So effectively, it is like any company on the stock market in that respect. And obviously, it means they're going to be announcing results twice a year so they can be extremely uh, transparent. Um, because it's a PLC structure, it also means that the fund itself, the trust itself, is a closed end vehicle, i.e. that there's a, there's a, a permanent capital structure. Uh, if, if you buy or sell the shares, it doesn't change the number of shares in issue. Having said that, uh, the PLC structure, like any company listed on the exchange, is very flexible because it obviously does enable you to issue more shares for cash or indeed to buy back shares. Um, they're obviously extremely easy to trade uh, because they're listed on the stock market. It's obviously you can trade through the day at any, pr uh, you know, whatever the price is. Share prices react like any stock does uh, in response to news flow, in response to to, to market movements and obviously in response to uh, the, the, the natural supply and demand uh, of shares. Um, the shares tend to be valued by the market at either uh, what is known as a discount or a premium to their net asset value. Uh, and I'll come on to explain a little bit later how that works and how that's calculated. So they're not traded at the spot NAV. Uh, which is how uh, unit trusts are traded. And obviously unit trusts are only traded uh, on at the spot NAV on a sort of daily basis rather than a by the minute basis. Uh, one of the attractions of investment trusts, and again, there's uh, another reason for their superiority, is that they can retain revenue reserves rather than paying out all their income. Um, and that's a really significant uh, benefit that they have compared to many other types of, uh, of, of funds, i.e. unit trusts. Uh, and again, I'll come on to explain a bit more about that a little later. Uh, and obviously, like any company, they can pay dividends and they can choose to pay those annually, half yearly, quarterly. Uh, and there's quite a range of, uh, of policies out there in terms of, of how they, they pay their dividends. They generally have lower purchase costs in terms of buying them in the market, i.e. for the larger trusts, the bid offer spreads are very narrow. I'll give an example of that a little later. You can expect to trade in them at you know, the sort of spread you'd expect to see uh, in, a, in a large cap company. They also have lower expenses relative to other types of aggregated investments. 
So the what is known as the total expenses ratio, the TER, for investment trusts is generally very low uh, when compared to an equivalent unit trust. Uh, and obviously, the bigger the, the investment trust is, as a general rule, the lower the total expenses ratio it, it would be. Uh, and typically, that might be around 1%, uh, and it might even be lower. Uh, what they can also do is they've got the flexibility of actually applying some of their costs to capital, uh, not just to the income account. Uh, and quite a few trusts have adopted that in recent years. So 50% of their expenses come off the capital account, 50% off the income account. And that does give them a little bit more flexibility, particularly in respect of retaining income to then pay out good dividends. Like any company, like any PLC on the market, they can gear up or that indeed they can de-gear to enhance returns, i.e. they can borrow money, uh, whether from a bank or whether from other, uh, from investors through a, a, a debenture. Uh, and that, that enables them to enhance returns uh, over time. It obviously equally might add a little bit of risk uh, if they've geared up going into a downturn such as we've seen recently. Uh, I think I mentioned already how transparent they are in terms of obviously having to announce results twice a year like any company does. Um, but also many of them announce the daily NAV uh, via the RNS service and many of them also provide a monthly performance sort of statistics newsletter uh, which can be found uh, through the RNS system and also on their websites. Uh, so you can keep yourself uh, appraised in terms of how they're performing and, and equally importantly, keep yourself appraised of actually what, what stocks they are holding in the trust, uh, which obviously gives you a, a sort of window uh, as to whether the, the fund is reflecting uh, the original reasons why you bought into it. Uh, in the investment trust world, uh, we often talk about a double discount. Uh, and what that means is that obviously if, if the investment trust uh, is investing in assets such as real estate, for example, uh, those shares in the real estate company might already be on a discount to net, a, net asset value. Uh, the investment trust itself is then on a discount to its net asset value. So in effect, you have a double discount. Now, the attraction of that is that it actually enhances the income that you receive off the investment trusts. Because if you think about it, you're getting 100% of the income, uh, but off having only acquired shares at 80% uh, cost uh, of the underlying value yeah. of those investments. Uh, so you can see that that effectively uh, provides a sort of uplift uh, in value. Uh, and one of the, the other attractions, again, as a, as a PLC, as a company, uh, when um, the fund management houses launch new investment trusts, uh, they'll IPO them. Uh, and retail investors can participate in these IPOs. Most of the platforms, certainly an interactive investor, Hargreaves, et cetera, do allow uh, retail investors access to those uh, investment trust IPOs. So that's something to, to look out for. Now, um, uh, the next slide um, deals with how the characteristics that I've described uh, on the previous two slides, uh, how those characteristics um, ensure that this sort of superior nature of investment trusts when compared to unit trusts uh, is delivered. There are a number of things I'd like to highlight. One is that they're quite often managed by maverick fund managers whose faces didn't particularly fit in the big fund management houses. Now, I suspect those individual fund managers might not uh, necessarily thank me for that comment, but but the reality is that um, the big fund management houses, by which I mean sort of, you know, JP Morgan Fleming, Schroeder's, Aberdeen Standard, you know, the, the reality is that the funds that they're marketing, whether investment trusts or unit trusts, are typically gonna be managed in quite a process-driven way. Uh, and the the choice of funds that they have is going to be pretty generalist in nature because they're being sold into the large wealth management houses, they're being sold into the big sort of pension fund managers, uh, and so on and so forth. 
uh, and therefore they, by definition, are going to be, as I say, quite generalist. Now, if you're the sort of fund manager who's quite a sort of original person, uh, quite a maverick, therefore, uh, in terms of your approach to investing, you're not probably going to fit into that sort of house. Uh, but you might fit in to a smaller house, which provides you with a bit more flexibility to kind of do your own thing. Uh, and in essence, that's what's happened in the investment trust industry over a number of years. Quite a lot of managers have left the big houses, set up their own fund management house, and then launched an investment trust, which kind of reflects their own personal investing uh, sort of approach. And that means they're basically much more entrepreneurial those sorts of uh, specialist uh, fund houses than the, the big generalist houses. It also means uh, that uh, typically they'll have a much longer tenure as a manager of that investment trust, which I think is a good thing because it, it provides consistency uh, in terms of the investing style, uh, rather than uh, being chopped and changed all the time. And certainly the big houses have a much bigger churn of fund manager. Uh, it gives more scope to specialise by sector, by asset, uh, and also to run uh, sort of atypical strategies or variations on the theme. Uh, so a kind of, uh, you know, a, basically a, a strategy which might not, again, fit into those big houses, but the individual fund manager in his own organisation can say, well, I'm going to do it this way. Uh, and actually that, you know, may well enhance returns that that, that individual can achieve for investors. It gives them a bit more scope to be activists um, and, and to be more flexible in terms of supporting companies that they've got in the portfolio, uh, you know, in terms of uh, providing additional follow-on capital. Uh, it gives them more scope to run highly concentrated portfolios. Again, if you look at the process-driven big fund management houses, they're typically going to run uh, very low concentration portfolios, i.e. the portfolios might have, you know, 80 to 120 stocks within them, uh, whereas uh, an individual uh, specialist fund manager uh, might launch a fund uh, and take a very concentrated approach and maybe only having sort of between 10 and 20 holdings. So if you are the sort of investor that, that likes that portfolio concentration, you can still find an investment trust which will give you that uh, effective concentration uh, in terms of the style that uh, that that uh, the the fund is investing in. Uh, and I've mentioned too, there's that that greater flexibility that they have in terms of holding debt or cash uh, to enhance returns, and th and that's a big difference uh, compared to to a lot of other type of uh, uh, of funds out there. Now. Um, I'm sure one question that you'll be interested to hear the answer for is how investment trusts performed uh, in the sell-off. If we look at the performance since the beginning of the year, the investment trusts in aggregate performed and were performing broadly in line with the market, and they typically would track market gyrations. However, they fell less in the sell-off than the market did as a, as a whole, and they've outperformed the rally and have actually opened up quite a, de a decent performance gap of around 10% in aggregate. So I think that's quite interesting that they have overall proved to be much less volatile uh, and, and much less uh, risky in effect uh, than the market as a whole. Um, in terms of costs, uh, I mentioned that earlier, the bigger and more liquid trusts by market cap are relatively cheaper to trade. And obviously that does mean that in a, a sell-off scenario, uh, you know, if you do want to sell stocks or buy stocks, uh, investment trusts are a segment of the market where generally speaking, you'll be able to get that liquidity and buy or sell. And I've got the example below there uh, of TR Property Investment Trust, which is a high quality fund investing in European real estate and typically the spread is one p one pence uh, on a three pound share price so as you can see a very tight spread typically using a platform i'd expect you to be able to get inside that and that effectively makes the dealing costs extremely low uh, buying a unit trust on a platform is going to cost considerably more than that in terms of the bid offer spread so that that's really quite 
and attractive in terms of the costs of owning these types of investment. Uh, the trusts uh, tend to move to wider discounts to the net asset value in sell-offs. Uh, that is a, a sort of natural uh, situation which you would expect in the way that you know company shares, if they sell off, will go to a bigger discount to you know the fair value of uh, of, of the PE. Um, similarly, in a sell-off, you would expect the discounts to widen. Obviously, that means there is in effect an opportunity to buy investment trust shares more cheaply uh, on that basis. And my next slide uh, shows the current valuations in the market, both in terms of the industry discount to net asset value. So that's the aggregated discount across the whole investment trust sector. And it also shows the current running dividend yield across the whole sector. And what it shows you is obviously the discount has widened quite significantly and right across the sector on average it's now about 10 percent uh, whereas it was slightly below five percent uh, prior to the sell-off and the dividend yield uh, which was around three and a half percent is now up pretty close to five percent so you can see that potentially that's a real attractive opportunity to take advantage uh, at the moment of these lower valuations uh, within the sector as a whole. Now, one of the most interesting things about investment trusts is, is what I've called the secret source. Uh, and, and these are the revenue reserves that most investment trusts hold uh, within their uh, balance sheets. And these revenue reserves are the real reason why that dividend yield that was shown on the prior chart is actually a genuine dividend yield. Uh, and not one that's going to be impacted to the same extent as the rest of the market by cuts in dividend. Let me explain that. So most investment trusts don't pay out all of their income uh, by rules in order to kind of meet the uh, categories for being an investment trust. They do have to distribute to shareholders 85% of income. However, uh, that means that effectively they can tuck away for a rainy day uh, the remaining 15% of their annual uh, income received from the dividends uh, on the underlying portfolio uh, holdings. Now, in many cases over the years, uh, a lot of investment trusts have built up revenue reserves that are around two times the annual dividend cash cost that they're paying out to shareholders, uh, which if you think about it, is a pretty conservative position to hold. But what it means is that it enables those dividends to be smoothed across the cycle. So uh, if you think about it uh, for the coming year, for example, with lots of underlying portfolio holdings cutting their dividends, how are these investment trusts, you know, how are they going to maintain their own dividends uh, if all their underlying shareholdings have been cutting? Well, the answer is they'll dip into these revenue reserves, which is cash sitting on the balance sheet, and they'll use those dividend reserves, those revenue reserves, to smooth the dividend payments. It's something they've done in previous financial crises, uh, and that's why they've got them. It's a proven methodology for smoothing their own dividends. And some of the trusts have got 50-year records of increasing dividends to shareholders. And they wouldn't have been able to do that across the many sort of cycles that we've had uh, without these revenue reserves. And on the right there, I've got a very good example, the TR Property Investment Trust that I mentioned earlier. Uh, if you can see it in small print there uh, on the retained earnings note seven in their, their last set of accounts, uh, the revenue reserve for the year ended March 2019 was 70 million, gone up slightly at the half year September to 74 million. The actual cash cost of the dividends they paid out uh, in the year to March 2019 uh, was 39 million. So you can see that the revenue reserve basically was giving them a float uh, of around 30 million extra on top of the annual dividend cost. So if, for the sake of argument, uh, the dividends flowing into the fund halved during 2020, 2021, then clearly they could then dip into that massive revenue reserve to top up the dividend that they then pay to shareholders. So that's just a, I mean, this this is 
the, the biggest attraction uh, of investment trusts, in my view, is the fact that they have this uh, unusual um, uh, structure that enables them to hold back those revenues and keep them and then use them uh, on a rainy day to smooth the dividends that they pay to their shareholders. Uh, and obviously, if you are an income investor and you rely on income, uh, then uh, investment trust could be a really useful source uh, of income for you uh, in the coming years. In this section, I'm going to talk about how to choose uh, individual investment trusts. And I'm going to start off talking about uh, some of the sort of more general choices that you need to make before you come down to making the sort of individual choice. So clearly, um, the first thing one needs to consider on that left-hand side there is the investment style. So am I an income investor, as discussed? Am I a growth investor? Uh, am I uh, a value investor, a recovery investor? So that's first choice. Second choice is, do I want to go domestic, UK only? Do I want to have some international exposure? How global do I want to be? Or do I want to be quite specific? Uh, I've got to choose the manager. You know, do I want to go for one of those big houses, big secure houses like JP Morgan, Fleming, Schroeder's, Standard Aberdeen, or do I want to go for one of the boutiques, the specialists, people like TR Property, for example, people like Herald Investment Trust? Uh, do I want to go for a sector bias or be more generalist, i.e., do I want to go after technology or private equity? Uh, or do I want to be more generalist, just, you know, as, you know, UK, you know, mid cap or something. Um, size, liquidity, also important. Do I want to go for a bigger trust, you know, market cap of over a billion, maybe a FTSE 250 or even a FTSE 100 that, that gives that sense of permanence and, and quality? Uh, or do I want to go for one of those boutique ones, which are, by definition tend to be quite a bit smaller in terms of market caps, and they might only be 100 million, 200 million market cap. And what's my risk appetite? You know, do I want to go for the things that are going to be more, there's going to be more beta, uh, or or do I want to go for something that's a, a little bit more uh, straightforward and steady uh, and boring? So consider all those things first. Then in terms of the individual trust that one is looking at, one needs to assess the following things. What's the current valuation? which is the discount to NAV, and I'm going to explain that on the next slide. What's the dividend yield? Has the dividend grown over the last few years? Uh, what's that revenue reserve that I've referred to? Uh, and one can look that up. Historically, actually, they haven't, in their results, they haven't tended to major on the size of the revenue reserve. And I think in this coming result season, we'll see that moving up, you know, in terms of it being highlighted uh, in results announcements. You know, what are the transaction and fund costs uh, in terms of dealing in the market when I buy the, the, the individual investment trust? Uh, and what are the underlying costs to the fund of it being managed by whichever boutique or big house is doing it? What's the track record over the years? What's the performance? Has it outperformed the market? Has it outperformed its peers? Uh, and it's quite easy to find that information out. Uh, and what are the perceptions around the trust? You know, the soft uh, uh, secret source uh, in terms of, you know, how well regarded the individual fund managers are. And obviously that's particularly important with the boutique fund managers that are, where effectively you're, you're putting your money behind one individual, one clever individual, uh, you know, uh, how well regarded is that individual uh, and are they somebody that you uh, would want to back? Uh, with your money. And, and fundamentally underlying it is the old principle, do your own research. And so how do you value these things? What are the metrics that we use? And the, the, the main one is the discount to net asset value. Obviously, the dividend yield is also going to be an important one as well. But the discount to the NAV is the key one. Uh, and this is kind of the equivalent to the PE uh, in the world of investment trusts. And it's obviously also similar to other asset-based sectors like real estate, so it's the same principle that we value it by calculating the discount or premium to the net asset value of the investment trust. The net asset value is the total net balance sheet value of the investments in the portfolio divided by the number of shares in issue. And that obviously gives you a net asset value per share number. Um, 
the discount is uh, can vary uh, hugely, uh, and the market, like any stock, like any company, where you see different PEs on different companies and different sectors, you know, as with investment trusts, that will vary relative to the track record of the individual investment trust, what sector it's in, if the sector's deemed to be attractive at the moment, um, what the level of risk is uh, around the underlying portfolio, what's the liquidity like, uh, you know, in obviously in the bigger trusts, uh, that tends to mean the discounts are narrower because the liquidity is very good. Uh, and the popularity, popularity of the individual fund manager, the boutique, the house, um, and whether or not the platforms have been recommending individual trusts uh, in their buy lists, controversial area in recent times, but nonetheless, that can be quite influential. Uh, and typically, as a rule of thumb, the following discount ranges are considered to reflect uh, a 0 to 10 percent discount is typically seen as kind of fair value. A 10 to 20 percent discount to net asset value is seen to be very attractive. And a 20 percent plus discount is seen as cheap. Uh, now, there obviously may be reasons why it's on that 20 percent discount. Uh, in terms of those things I mentioned earlier, the track record, the sector, the risk, the liquidity, et cetera. Uh, there may be a context for that, but nonetheless, on any any measure, uh, a discount of over 20% uh, really is cheap and attractive. And of course, it enhances uh, the dividend yield uh, because the income in the portfolio that is being paid to shareholders uh, is based on 100% of the assets but you effectively, when you buy the shares, are buying them at 80% uh, of the underlying value of the investment trust. So your income is enhanced. And obviously, by the same token, a premium is therefore expensive. Uh, it's rather like buying a stock on a PE of 30. Uh, you, you might think twice before you do so, but it may reflect the fact that the trust has an amazing track record uh, and is extremely popular with investors. So if the trust is on a premium, and it's quite unusual that they are, uh, it, it, you need to look carefully as to why it is and whether it's justified. A key thing, obviously, the next sort of layer down in terms of choosing uh, uh, investment trust is choosing the sector that we invest in. And uh, the styles and sectors, I suspect you, 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 most of you will be familiar with, but basically you can buy, but you can buy investment trusts across all of the styles and sectors on the left-hand side there. Smaller companies, technology, fintech, private equity, venture capital, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera, you name it, uh, you can get involved in it, gold, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and in terms of uh, some other things, um, I've listed on the right what I call special situations. Now, these are maybe for the more advanced uh, investment trust investor, uh, but they're very interesting, and the sector traditionally has thrown up lots of special situations. Uh, these can be things like when the investment trust actually owns a stake in the boutique fund manager that runs the investment trust. Um, that can add significant value uh, to uh, the value of the investment trust if the fund manager is performing very well itself. Uh, and there are a number of examples of that. Trusts which own and manage other financial services businesses, and extraordinarily there are uh, one or two that, that do that as well. Uh, trusts that are in wind up or realization mode, that effectively means they've come to the end of their life and the board has decided to, to basically wind the thing up. Uh, and quite often that's a very attractive way to deliver value. And then trusts with expensive debt to refinance. So those that have taken on gearing, quite often have taken on gearing uh, from the past, you know, from 10, 20 years ago when interest rates were much higher. Uh, and those bits of debt are beginning to reach maturity now, which means they can pay them back, refinance them and save lots of money, which gives another, another angle. So there's plenty of choice basically, uh, and it can really drive portfolio diversification. So my SIP, because I've uh, effectively chosen lots of these different styles, sectors, special situations, gives me tremendous portfolio diversification, uh, you know, without having to worry about individual company stock selection in individual sectors.
So uh, let's choose some of those sector themes more specifically uh, and, and the ones that I've got in my SIP. And this may obviously not suit everybody, but it, but it works for me, which is that I've gone for some high growth sectors uh, where I think there's some real dynamics which are going to drive uh, values uh, for the future. Uh, one is private equity and venture capital. Uh, those are really interesting investment trusts principally because it's not an asset class that most of us normally have access to. Most of us aren't rich enough, basically, to throw five million at a, uh, a private equity fund manager and say, here, run that money for me, sadly. Uh, but we can do the same thing by buying into one of their investment trusts or one of their venture capital trusts. Um, and that means we can get access to some really quite exciting high growth businesses and some examples that I've given there, which are in a number of funds are things like Revolut, TransferWise and Interactive Investor itself. Um, so uh, some really interesting holdings and private equity uh, has over the years delivered annualized returns that are way in advance of the stock market. So the attraction for an individual investor to be able to get access to a market that grows quicker than the stock market through the stock market by buying an investment trust, to me, is a pretty nice play. Uh, and obviously, smaller and micro cap company trusts, another good way to play the small cap market. Um, AIM has outperformed uh, the all share and the FTSE 100 this year. I think we all know that smaller micro companies can grow quicker in low growth circumstances than big companies. Um, and they also have a tendency to be gobbled up uh, and taken over. Uh, so again, that's a big bet that I've made in my SIP. And technology trusts, lastly but not leastly, um, again, uh, a very exciting high growth area of the market. Quite a tricky one to choose individual companies in because they are quite high risk uh, and can be quite volatile. So a good way of playing that is through the investment trusts that specialize in technology. And I've got another 10% or so in that. Obviously, a good point to make is that actually, if you look at those three sectors, there's actually a lot of technology in the small cap uh, area and in the private equity area. I would guess off the top of my head that probably at the moment, a good 30% of most small micro cap companies, uh, trusts are probably invested in technology shares and probably the same with private equity and venture capital. So you get a good exposure also to international through these sectors. So if you want to get a bit more non-UK, then you'll find, again, the investment trusts in most of these sectors are investing overseas as well, particularly in the US and particularly in Asia. So that gives you another, another angle. So let's choose some individual trusts uh, and think about some of the ones that we might have a look at. And so firstly, I'm going to disclose here what my holdings are in my SIP in the investment trust sector. I've actually also added some other individual stocks uh, which are not in the investment trust sector, but essentially are managed like investment trusts, uh, but for various reasons, and I won't go into those reasons, are actually listed under asset managers or another sector. And those are things like Allied Mines, BP Marsh, Draper Esprit, IP Group, Mercia, Eric's Bioscience, so there'll be, there may be names that you'll be familiar with. So they're effectively investment trusts in, in, all, but, uh, in all but name uh, and are run on a very extremely similar basis and I think can be considered within this universe. And you can see where I've got my holdings and the individual names um, and I've got a nice spread across uh, those big sectors that I've gone for, uh, but also in some of the other sectors uh, and some pure international exposure through some other uh, investment trusts investing in Asia. And of course, one of the attractions uh, of investment trusts is being able to buy uh, something like Henderson Far East Income or the Global Emerging Markets uh, Trust, uh, the JPM run, where I don't know anything about Asian equities. Uh, I don't know anything about emerging market equities. I haven't got the time. I haven't got the knowledge, the expertise to buy individual companies in those markets. So much easier for me to effectively delegate that task to those uh, fund managers and, and buy one of their funds. So um, I thought I'd focus in on a few investment trusts, which I think are really well positioned 
at the moment, uh, both going into the down side of, uh, of the sell-off, uh, but also coming back out the other side. Uh, and basically, these are trusts who, either by luck or judgment, or a combination of both, held a, a very large slug of cash uh, in their trusts uh, going into the downturn. And in no particular order, you can see, you know, Downing, 24% cash, Dunedin Enterprise, 33%, Gresham House, 19%, Herald, 13 so on and so forth, big chunks of ca cash, Oakley with a stonking 36% in cash, 60% uh, of their current market cap. And, and what's interesting about uh, these trusts is actually they're all on big discounts as well, a number of them on 20% plus discounts, 46% uh, in the case of IP Group. Uh, so uh, if you think about uh, grossing the cash up, you know, an IP group, effectively, that means it's got 20% in cash in terms of you buying the shares at the current share price. Uh, and it also means in terms of those that pay a dividend, uh, by the same token with those big discounts, uh, you're getting a better dividend yield. So, uh, uh, and the opportunity, obviously, for these individual investment trusts is they can participate in placings in their existing holdings, placings and rights issues in their existing portfolio companies, uh, particularly those that may be struggling, but equally they've got the cash to go and buy new positions in uh, businesses that they think are good value and, and will recover. Uh, very quickly, IP Group, I mention it because um, it, it's one that I think is quite interesting in terms of reading the signals that they give in their results statements. And one of the great things, as I said, about these vehicles is that they have to issue their results to the stock exchange on RNS. And they have a chairman's statement and you know financial highlights like all company announcements do and, and if you read between the lines they can give you pretty clear signals about what they think and so ip group when they announced the 11th of march uh, made this point that they'd realized 79 million in cash from the portfolio by selling down their private equity and venture capital investments and that exceeded the investment into new opportunities for the first time since 2007 and they've continued that into 2020 uh, just in the first three months alone and actually you may have seen overnight that they placed a stake in Ceres Power uh, which they uh, have backed over a uh, many uh, number of years and they've now got over a hundred million in cash as a result of that uh, so that puts them in an incredibly strong position and they then gave a nice clue in the statement where they said, we anticipate further commercial and technical updates from a number of other companies over the coming 12 months. So basically what they're saying is, we, we can see within the portfolio, lots of bits of good news coming out from the portfolio over the next year. Now, uh, just an interesting angle on this is that if you, uh, if you know anything about private equity, one of the things that private equity funds, venture capital funds get excited about is when they achieve what is known as evergreen status. And that's when the portfolio is maturing at such a rate that they're selling investments at the same rate as they're investing in new investments. So essentially IP Group has reached evergreen status and that puts it in a very strong position. So uh, another example would be Mercia Asset Management, uh, which some of you may have heard of, and they talk a lot about their goal to reach evergreen status. Uh, and they think they're getting closer and closer to that and, and expect to sort of achieve that in the next year or two. Uh, and they're, they're, they're beginning to get quite excited about that. Uh, very quickly, why I own something called Majedi Investments. Uh, it's a, a, a self-managed uh, investment trust, i.e. It's, it's managed by a boutique fund manager called Majedi. Um, I bought into it because it owns a significant stake in that fund manager in the Majedi business. Uh, it also has a, an expensive debenture nearing redemption. That's the debt that I referred to earlier. Um, and it has huge revenue reserves as well. So it's got kind of a, a triple benefit. The holding in its own fund manager, so its own shareholding in Majedi, it was valued at 23% of NAV uh, last September. Now, uh, fund managers' valuations have probably fallen 20% uh, in the sell-off. Having said that, Majedi has won some new mandates, so hopefully that downturn in the NAV shouldn't be uh, so dramatic. Uh, half of its income to pay the dividend was from this holding. 
and the debenture stock has a seven and a quarter percent coupon. So when that's redeemed in 2025 and they refinance it, there's going to be a significant saving on interest cost. Uh, that that cost in the last uh, set of results, one and a half million in interest. So if they refinance that at, I don't know, two or three percent, say, it's going to save you know, half a million quid or something, which can be, then be paid out in dividends to shareholders. So that's a fantastic position. And again, a very strong, exceptionally strong revenue reserve. And some quarterly dividend pairs, if you're an income investor, there are plenty of stocks that you can find which pay dividends quarterly. So that's really attractive for those uh, who are reliant on the income from their portfolios uh, to uh, fund their retirement. So some quick views on the market. My view, I suspect shared by many, is that one's balancing extreme caution about the economic outlook with relative confidence in the fiscal and monetary outlook. And of course, that's the big difference between now and the financial crisis is that we've got more positivity around the fiscal and monetary outlook than we did back then, which is a really significant difference. I think the known knowns are arguably already in the current price of the market as a whole. Uh, the known knowns being that actually none of us know how the world is going to look next year or the year beyond. Uh, we also know there will be a severe recession. I don't think we're any doubt about that. And that's going to impact some individual companies extremely badly, extremely hard. Uh, but the, uh, there is a, a balance of risk. There are also plenty of unknown unknowns which might come and shock us later. But remember, the stock market is a discounting forward-looking mechanism. So essentially, we are now looking forward to the recovery in a year's time and two years' time. We're not looking back at, at the, the, the horrible mess that, that we've had in the last couple of months. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm reasonably positive about the market. Uh, and just quickly running this on, lots of positives for equities. You know, UK institutions and international institutions have been underweight equities throughout the whole of the Brexit fiasco. Uh, they've been overweight cash. There's evidence they're now buying back into UK equities, uh, not least because Brexit obviously got resolved. Uh, so I think there will be demand. Uh, we're probably in better equilibrium between companies going off the exchange and the potential for companies to come on the exchange. Uh, lots of people who have been still working clearly are saving money at the moment. And I think that the, the if you can't spend it, then save it philosophy may be helpful to the stock market because it means that people will have money to put into their SIPs and ISAs. Uh, the Chancellor gave us enhanced tax incentives for pensions by removing uh, an element of the tapering threshold at the upper end. Um, and uh, private equity is cashed up and ready to go. Um, once existing portfolios are secured, there's more money sitting, uninvested cash sitting in private equity funds than at any time in history, reckoned to be several trillion dollars. Uh, strong companies are raising money. We've seen uh, that in the last few weeks, uh, and they're going to use that for M&A and growth funding. Banks are in the best shape for a generation to lend. Uh, we always know they need a bit of a kick up the posterior to do so, but they are in a very strong position relative to the financial crisis. And last but not least, the, the UK is in control of its own monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, using it wise, wisely, that's a good place to be. But of course, there is significant so stock and sector specific risk to set against that positive view. So in conclusion, uh, investment trusts, easy stocks to forget about and hold forever because you can buy it. You know the fund manager is doing a good job because that's why you bought it. So lock it away and you can sleep easy at night. Uh, but do top slice uh, and actually do buy back later uh, if the shares sell off in this sort of market sell off. And of course, one of the advantage of holding a, a, you know, an investment trust for 10 years is that uh, there will be sell-offs along the way. And actually, even if you top slice when the market's going up, you'll be pretty sure to have a chance to buy it back cheaper later. And, and I've certainly been able to do that uh, in the last couple of months. They're a great proxy investment as a way to play a sector or theme where you're not entirely sure which individual company share to buy but you know the sector is going to do well or the, a, a certain investing theme is going to do well, well, buy an investment trust that, that gets you that access. Um, there's always the Woodford type risk, so keep a wary eye uh, on things in that respect. Uh, and ultimately, in the end, remember that dividends are a major component of compound returns in the stock market, and these 
uh, investment trusts are one of the few sectors that's going to continue to be able to pay dividends because of the revenue reserves that the majority of them hold. So good luck, go well uh, in your investing, and uh, let's move to the Q&A. We've got a question by Mark Glary. Do you want to ask your question? Very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I love a lot, lot of that, not least how to pronounce Majide or whatever it is, which I've never Majide. really known. Majedi. <laughs> there you go. I still don't quite know. But that's very useful. Um, now, you did mention that dealing costs on, on investment trusts uh, you know, are quite uh, low. In my experience, they're variable. Sometimes they're really, really cheap. And other times, they're you know, not quite so so good. But you said it compares well with uh, what you described as a unit trust. And it's kind of, I mean, they're not really, they don't really call unit trust any longer. They're now all these um, OEICs, open-ended investment conduits. Now, mm -hmm. my understanding is generally there isn't a bid offer spread or there's not one that's apparent. You just, there's one price for dealing. So I just wanted to ask you about that. Uh, I get the impression there is still a bit of a dealing spread on some of those types of vehicles. Uh, the sort of mutual funds that you might buy on the Hargreaves platform that might be also managed by the likes of Schroeder's and JP Morgan Fleming and Aberdeen Standard. I mean, I personally don't invest in them, so uh, but but I gather there is still dealing spreads uh, and a bid offer spread on most of those types of funds. John Dunn, do you want to ask your question, John? Uh, thank you, Tenzin. Reg, fascinating overview, very cogent, and can I say without making you blush, beautifully delivered. Um, I hold some of the trusts which you referred to, um, OECI, for example. Um, but I noticed that you hold Hansa and mm -hmm. Polo Resources. Mm. And I, th I think it's fair to say uh, over the last maybe five or six years, their performance has been poor mm. and discounts have been substantial. Yeah. Um, it's not for me to ask when you bought them, but, but, but given that poor performance relative to NAV, how do you deal with that? Do you wait for the it to close or, or – and you must be a very patient man if you do, but that's <laughs> the essence of the question. Yeah, uh, and that's a very good question. I mean, one of the advantage of holding a lot of stocks, as I do, and having a low concentration portfolio, is that I've probably only got, you know, 2 to 3% max in those kind of holdings. And therefore, if it underperforms for a period of time, it's kind of not doing me too much damage to the overall portfolio performance, uh, particularly if I've got some other things that are doing better. So I can afford to be patient with it. Um, and in the case of, you know, Hansa, there's some very good reasons why it's underperformed, which is that it's got a very big hold. It's a very, very unusual structure, as, as you may be aware, with 30% of the portfolio in one listed company, Ocean Wilson's, which itself has a slightly unusual corporate structure. Uh, and then about 70% of it in other sort of individual funds. So it's sort of a fund to fund. And Oceans is heavily exposed to the Brazil economy. So it's a bit of an unusual one. But yeah, I'm basically, I'm prepared to be patient and wait for these things to improve. And and if the discount widens, I might buy a few more. Uh, if it closes uh, and the shares go up, uh, then I might decide to sell a few. Uh, in the case of Hansa, uh, I've done that over the years. Um, it's paying a dividend at the moment, so I'm, I'm happy to sit and wait. Polo is a, a, a tricky one because Unfortunately, the management team that took it over a few years reneged on their commitment to return cash to shareholders. So it was one of these special sits that was in a wind-up situation, and it was looking a very attractive opportunity. And it appears that the current management team are basically uh, the worst type of um, AIM uh, uh, management teams, the sort that Tom Winifrith is fond of having a go at for, for good reason. And they've participated over a, a drop in value over the last few years by not following that uh, process of winding up the fund, which has been very disappointing. I've become part of an activist group which is trying to ginger that up. Uh, a little bit of progress has been made if you look at recent RNSs, uh, but we're yet to have a conclusion to that situation. But again, I can afford to sit and wait on it because it's it's been a smallish, you know, as a percentage of my my portfolio, it's quite small. So Griff Hewis asks, what's on Reg's watch list at the moment? Ooh, yes, very good question. So uh, actually, there were a couple on there which I sort of put in as, as portfolio holdings, where actually I don't hold it at the moment. 
um, which is uh, the one by the name of Odyssean, uh, another one, difficult one to pronounce. Uh, I think it was named after Odysseus, uh, the classical character. Um, and I bought it in the IPO, uh, which was about ooh, two or three years ago. And um, it performed quite decently, um, but it was sitting on a premium to the net, net asset value. And I thought it looked quite expensive, particularly going into the sell-off. And I used it as a source of cash by selling it down and selling out completely uh, during sort of March and used it to buy back some other stuff. Uh, and I also traded it uh, at the bottom of the market fortuitously, bought a few in sort of late March, uh, saw a quick 10% turn and was quite pleased with myself. Um, but it's actually looking really quite attractive still with sitting on a lot of cash. Uh, and the disc there's now a discount, whereas, as I say, it had been on a premium. So in terms of valuation, it looks reasonable. And it's a very concentrated uh, small cap. Uh, investment trust run by somebody called Stuart Widowson, who's a very well-known uh, individual fund manager with a fantastic track record. So I think that's quite an interesting one that uh, that I'd be thinking of, you know, that's on my watch list to buy back into uh, having previously held it. Great. Um, we've got a question from, same question virtually from two people. So Nyla Shukla asks, any views on investment trust trading at a significant premium, yet very popular, e.g. Linsel Train, but sometimes difficult to trade in? And then Ben Sharman says about the same um, investment trust, what are the risks of buying something like Linsel well, Train? I think very high because if it, if it comes off, you know, there's a double whammy, um, the reverse of the discount closing, you know, the premium closing means, let's say the market goes down and the premium closes, you're going to lose on both counts quite significantly. And actually, interestingly, on the AIC website, that's the Association of Investment Companies, which is like the umbrella industry organization for investment trusts, they've on... Uh, on the website, they've got a very interesting little uh, table showing you how risky it is. Uh, it's a sort of sensitivity analysis, and it shows the impact uh, of the premium in terms of how much the underlying portfolio has got to grow in order to close the gap and what the effect would be if it fell and blah, blah, blah. So I, I think that's quite risky. And funnily enough, I did hold Linsel Train a number of years ago, and I sold it when it started trading at a premium because I was a little bit concerned uh, about uh, doing so. As I say, it's the equivalent of, you know, owning a very highly rated individual stock, you know, that's a, a fever tree or a games workshop, you know, on a P of 35 or something. It's equivalent risk. That, that, you know, if there's a profits warning and the thing halves, uh, that's bad enough. But if the P, you know, on the remaining earnings is then 10 times, not 35 times, you've had a double whammy. So uh, so I'm quite uh, quite twitchy about, uh, about those sorts of trusts. And would the same go for biotech trusts? So Bob Meadows asks, what's your view on the key biotech trusts? all of which seem to be trading high on price and low discounts. Same answer, really. Yeah, same answer, really. And, and you can see that actually I haven't got much exposure to biotech at the moment for that reason, that, that yeah. I'm kind of reluctant to pay over the odds to pay a premium for the, to get that exposure, as attractive as that exposure is. I've got quite a bit of exposure anyway through uh, the venture capital and private equity trusts that I own. Uh, because IP Group, for example, its biggest portfolio company is Oxford Nanopore, uh, the DNA people, DNA sequencing people. So you can actually get your your biotech healthcare type exposure through those other type of investment trusts and buy into them on a discount. So kind of why wouldn't you switch out of a healthcare trust maybe into one of those, you know, uh, venture capital or or private equity type trusts? Uh, on a big discount. So that that's kind of how I've done it. I did hold something called BBH Healthcare uh, Trust, which was very good, performed extremely well. Uh, and I sold out of it during the, the sell-off because it bounced back very quickly. It was higher sort of in April than it had been in 
in February. Uh, and I've, again, I've used that as a source of cash to buy into sort of things that have been bombed out. And you mentioned that, sorry, this is from Bill Hall. You mentioned that investment trusts can attract maverick managers who like to work in smaller businesses. You might not want to, but can you name a few who you admire? Ooh, yes. Your choice. The, the obvious one, um, it, and, and I, I should choose my words carefully. So North Atlantic, smaller companies, um, Christopher Mills, that's run that for years, uh, is, is sort of notorious uh, within the uh, investment banking community uh, for being a, a, a sort of maverick kind of investor um, and uh, who, you know, he invests his own way. He does things his own way. Uh, and he's got an amazing track record. Uh, and the North Atlantic Smaller Companies is a very unusual structure. So it's UK and US or North American smaller companies. It's also got some venture capital, private equity investment within it. And it's a highly concentrated fund. So it's only got, I don't know, 10 or ten to 20 investments, something of that order. He's got a huge holding in it, a huge personal holding in it uh, as well. Um, so it, it's a very unusual structure. You just wouldn't you know, if you were sitting in Schroeder's marketing department, you simply wouldn't come up with an investment trust structured like that. Uh, and that's one of the attractions of investing in investment trusts is we all can go and buy something like that, uh, which is, you know, it's quite a binary buy. You know, we're relying on Mr. Mills, his skills, but my God, you know, he's got a good track record. Uh, but the trust is on a big discount, so it reflects the perceived risk around him as an individual and around the concentration of the portfolio. Another one actually would be Herald Investment Trust that uh, Tamsin and I had been talking about earlier today. Uh, Katie Potts, who uh, she founded Herald uh, best, ooh, 25, 30 years ago, run it ever since. Again, it's a very unusual fund. It's, it's UK and North America principally. It's small cap technology, media and telecoms. Uh, unusual in that respect again you probably wouldn't invent it if, if, if you you know if you weren't her uh, and again she's somebody that you know wouldn't uh, i think have ever sat happily or comfortably uh, in one of the big fund houses so that's probably just a couple of examples another would be addition that i've just mentioned stuart widdison you know is is one of those guys who you know you know the reason he set up addition uh, was because he wanted to do it his way which was to have a very concentrated portfolio, 10 or, 10 or 20 stocks, small cap stocks. And I'm going to sneak in one last question, which is from James Ridgewell, who asks, do investment trusts that have a significant family shareholder have a better long-term performance? And he cites RIT Capital Partners. Oh, gosh, uh, that's an extremely good question. And I honestly don't know the answer to that. And I suspect the answer is is probably yes. Um, it, they probably do, because that alignment of interests between the manager uh, and the portfolio when it's your own family money is going to be pretty significant. And remember the history of most of the older investment trusts many of which have got histories going back not just 50 years, but 100 years or more, is that they were actually family offices which became investment trusts when the families got very spread out, uh, you know, in terms of the generations. And uh, as a result of which, the family thought, well, actually, let's launch this on the stock market as an investment trust. Um, and then it can be open to outside investors as well as our own family. So there's actually lots of examples like RIT, like Hansa that we talked about earlier, the Salomon family who uh, uh, own a big chunk of that. Christopher Mills at North Atlantic is, is a modern example of it. So I think that alignment of interests, you know, they're not going to bet the house on a, on a wrong one. You know, if it's your own money, uh, I think you're going to be, you know, you're really going to do your due diligence uh, and make sure you get it, get it right. So I think that is a, personally, I think that's a, you know, going back to the special, the list of special situations, I think that's one we can add to that list of, of special situations is, is the, the kind of family office style 
investment. The uh, the other one actually, the other big one worth mentioning in that respect is is Caledonia, uh, which some of you may be aware, which is the Kayser family. Uh, they uh, again, the family owns a big chunk of that one, and that's again, that's an interesting investment trust because that's quite a concentrated one. It's a mix of, of small and mid cap and private equity investments. Again, quite an unusual structure. You wouldn't you wouldn't get get it in any other uh, kind of investment house. Um, and you know, being effectively a family backed business, they they can manage it in that way. You know, for the benefit uh, of themselves and outside shareholders in terms of enhancing returns. So, thank you very much for all those questions, Reg. Can you tell us where people can find you? Uh, yes, they can find me on Twitter at Reg Hoare. That's nice and easy. Uh, where I do, I mean, I tweet about lots of stuff, but I occasionally tweet little gems about stocks and shares. Uh, mostly, actually, probably more about the investment trusts than the individual companies. So you can follow me there. And actually on LinkedIn, uh, there's some interesting content, which I quite often stick up on LinkedIn. So uh, yeah, that's where I can be found. Tremendous. Well, thanks very much indeed, Ray. It was a already fascinating... Got, already, already got some people uh, following me as a result of that comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was so a welcome. fascinating presentation. So thank you thank very you. much indeed. Well, so, thank you very much, Tamsin. Enjoyed it. Oh, good. If you want an email notification of webinars or events PI World are organising, please sign up for events on the right hand side of the homepage at PI World. There are two boxes. At the top, sign up for a notification of a new video as it's published. And the second box down, sign up for events. They're different lists and no spam. And do tell your investing friends about PI World and write comments or like our videos on Twitter and bullet on and on bulletin boards and on YouTube. My Twitter handle is at Tamsin PI World. We'd love to go on providing these free webinars and getting really good speakers like Reg rely on you and the audience number that we attract. So thank you for all your Twitter and social media interaction so far. It really makes a difference. Thank you all for joining us today and stay well. Goodbye for now.